is just happy to be um, talking with our fantastic speaker today, Megan Bozina. My name is Rachel Almodovar, and I'm here to welcome you to the UC San Diego Learning Biz Series Season 1, Episode 6, recorded on April 1st, 2001. Again, welcome everyone. So happy that you're able to join us for this series. Again, my name is Rachel Almodovar and we have some fantastic information for you. There are some resources in the chat. So if you're just logging in and joining us, just wanted to point you to those resources available in the chat for your reference. The Learning Biz series is a UC San Diego virtual series of talks introducing you to leaders, dreamers, innovators, and change champions. This series is designed to inspire you with ideas that matter to you and your world one talk at a time. Today's talk is becoming a ghostbuster from haunting problem to implemented solution with our change champion for innovation and agility, Megan Mozina. If you are watching live, thank you. It's great to have you here and engage and ask questions. So throughout the talk, we love to see your chat and reactions on your profiles. And at the end, we have reserved time for our featured speaker to respond to your questions and comments. It's a great way to engage with the speaker. And also, it, we have time for you to ask questions. And it is really one of our favorite parts of the series. If you're watching the recorded version on YouTube, then we ask you to click on the like button and subscribe to the channel. Again, today's talk with Mo Megan Mozina with our champion for innovation and agility. Megan Mozina, she, her, Aya, is the founder and principal of Presta Solutions, a Chicago-based woman-owned educational and consulting practice. As an award-winning consultant and facilitator, Megan helps growing leaders at purpose-driven organizations, including universities, get breakthrough results from their projects so that they can make a positive difference in their team now and in the future. She focuses on creativity and innovation, change management and project leadership. She is a leader and entrepreneur and also a preferred partner for UC San Diego's learning and development needs. We are very fortunate to feature her today for the Learning Boost series. So let's give a warm welcome in the chat to Megan Mosina. Hello, everyone. It's so great to virtually have you here. Thank you for your warm welcomes. Um, like Rachel was saying, I, um, I have a long career of working with a lot of different purpose-driven organizations, but particularly with universities. I worked in universities for about 13 years, and then as a consultant, I've continued to work with universities all the time. So you are my people, and I'm so happy to see you here. Um, in our talk today, we do want to make this an interactive learning experience or as much as a formal presentation can be. So we want you to have the worksheet that we've provided. Um, so if you were able to access it ahead of time, that's great. And if not, if you're here live, Rachel is dropping into the chat some links for you to be able to get either the Google Doc or PDF version of that. And if you are watching this recorded, good for you. And you can go to the red link that you'll see on my slide here. So it says www.crestasolutions.com forward slash learning boost. So you can go there to access the handout that we'll be using to make this an interactive learning experience for you, a place where you can reflect. All right, so as we get started, I want to share with you what my intentions are for being here today. So first of all, to help you see that you're not alone and probably feeling pretty overwhelmed by all these projects that are haunting you. Uh, I want to share a framework with you that I think will really help you ground the projects, er, the problems from something that's um, difficult and looming and um, frustrating to something that you feel that you can 
um, get your, your mind around a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And then also to make this, like I said, a, a learning experience. So it goes from being a passive experience to um, just listening to being more active by using the handout and for um, processing your thoughts and everything on that. And so our first step here then is for you to grab that handout and to think, uh, what is your intention for this session? And write down a few notes. You're welcome to drop them in the chat as well. Um, but also it's you know good for you to not just think it, but actually write it out. What is your intention? Is your intention in coming here to learn something new and to grow? Or are you going to try to be answering a few emails while you listen um, and do what you got to do? But it's just something to think about as part of your intentions and being here. Are you here to learn for you? Or is it something you intend to take back to your team because it's something that would be useful? Is your intention to just learn? Are you here because you just like learning and you're a professional development junkie like I am? Or are you here because this session description called to you for a specific reason because it's something specific and timely that you're dealing with? So think about what is your intention for being here today and center yourself on that so that you can really try to get out of it what you hope. Okay, so I'll take, take a moment to do that. Then as we go forward, I want to focus on the fact that this talk today is about problems that are haunting you, that are kind of looming behind you, that you feel weighing on your shoulders. That's a little bit of a negative connotation to the word problem. We could use challenges. We could use opportunities. There are a lot of different words. So whatever word you think is best for you, you can look at it in that sort of light. But the reason specifically that I'm using the word problem when talking about this is because I am grounding all of this work in research-backed academic discipline of creative problem solving. And so the word problem is in there. That's the, the discipline, the theory set. And so that's why I'm choosing to word, use the word problem. Um, but I encourage you to think of it in, in a positive light of an opportunity as well. And a lot of times we think about projects that might be looming over us, okay? But these are, you know, also projects, initiatives, solutions. And you'll see here that these are two intentionally separate circles that are not the same as each other, okay? There's a reason why this is not a Venn diagram or two very entirely overlapping circles. These problems and challenges and opportunities, what you can do when you apply a project leadership framework like I'm going to talk about today, you take them from being this nebulous thing that you don't really know how to approach all the time to being something that's more grounded in a set of steps and tangible actions that you can carry forward. And in doing so, it helps reduce some of the overwhelm and the stress related to it. So it goes from being a problem to being something more tangible. And this is even some of the distinction between um, what we would think about in terms of project management and project leadership. In project management, a lot of times you already know what your solution is. And it's something that you say, okay, well, I know what, what you know, project I'm supposed to implement, or I know the thing that I'm supposed to be doing. But when you have a problem, you're starting at the kind of problem level, sometimes it's like, well, how do you even do this? You need to approach it from a, a leadership level before you can even think about managing it as a set of steps to be implemented. So as we're helping you reflect a little bit here, in your handout, please note down the answer to the next question. What are some work problems that you haven't solved yet? So what are some of these problems that are really hanging over you <laughs> that you're dealing with. And of course, you're welcome to drop them in the chat. I can see if people wouldn't feel super comfortable doing that because it's kind of admitting some sort of shame that we unfortunately have. So I encourage you to think, write down a few examples, especially because having an example in the front of your head will help ground this discussion for you. You can apply your own personal example to that, um, to the, your learning experience today. So I know that I'm asking you to, you know, think about all these problems that you have that are looming over you. And that can be kind of stressful and it makes it feel like the problems are just growing and growing. And then the longer you don't deal with them, the bigger they become and they become this thing that's just 
overwhelming and it makes you feel really, well, I shouldn't tell you how you feel. <laughs> you know exactly how you feel. So what I would invite you to do is, again, in your handout, I want you to answer the question of what physical sensations do you have when you're thinking about these looming problems, okay? So I'm not, not feelings, the physical sensations. What happens in your body when you're thinking about these things? Yeah, so Rachel, you know, she grabbed her shoulders. Yes, you feel like a weight on your shoulders. Sometimes people, your, your heart starts to beat a little faster and gets, you know, really attractive, sweaty palms. Your stomach might feel a little weird, you know? So there's some of those things where it's, you know, it's important to notice those activations and physical responses um, to that stress. And then the next question, how do you react to these feelings? So what, so what are some of the actions that you take? Oftentimes um, I see two different types of reactions. You know, there's the avoidance that, oh, this is so stressful. And now like this problem that's been haunting me, I'm gonna just avoid it even more because I have so much daily work to do. I'm at, you know, no lack of a amount of stuff to do. So I, um, I'll, I'm just gonna avoid that for now. And it's understandable. And then, Something else that's pretty common is this like, okay, no, I'm going to do it today. I'm, today's the day. I'm, it's the beginning of the month. I'm going to start doing this. And you start to work on it, but then you get about five seconds into it. You're like, no, 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 I, I can't do this. I can't do this. You know, and close it out and get back to your stuff or go get your, you know, warm beverage or whatever it is. And so those are some ways that we typically respond to things. And so I'm thinking about those physical sensations. You know, think about how M. Night Shyamalan wants us to feel when we're watching his, his movies, right? Like we feel those same sorts of physical sensations, don't we? That when you're watching it, your heart starts to beat faster and then your hands get clammy and your stomach feels a little weird and you feel this kind of stress, your body tightens. And we also, you see those characters in those movies maybe do the same types of things that you do when you're facing these kind of looming problems in your department. So you might see them, see, they see this ghost, they see this thing that's haunting them and they either run away, they try to avoid it or they act all brave, you know, for like five seconds looking, you know, trying to face it. And then, and then they're like, okay, I'm good. And they, <laughs> and they leave. So it gets to be this thing that really, that really starts to weigh on us. So, um, you know, I just get you all stressed out before I start telling you about my own stressful stories. So this is what we're doing. So like I said, um, I worked in universities and continue to work with universities um, for a long time. And um, so obviously my, my office space did not look anything like this one on the image here because I'm <laughs> working in a university. Um, but something that was something that I'm sure that you can relate to is you probably have some sort of notebook or or board up on your wall or something like that. Of all these things that you'd love to do, these problems that you need to deal with at some point, and it just keeps growing and growing, and you have more of them that are on there to the point you know where you don't even want to look at them, and then it causes you to start avoiding and um, avoiding other people too. So um, I'll give I have so many examples that I could give you, but one that I think is particularly timely, even today, um, uh, Inside Higher Ed, they had a, an article, and it's, I think for the past week or so, about um, Ukrainian and, and Russian students who are really struggling because of, well, for a whole lot of reasons, but in, in particular, this article was about funding, their funding being cut off um, and um, devaluation of currencies and things like that, okay? So um, a number of years ago in 2012, I was working um, at a university on an initiative to support Syrian students. That's right about the time that the Syrian conflict was really becoming a war. And we had an initiative where we brought um, almost 50 students over a few years to our institution to um, be able to finish their bachelor's degrees. And it was an amazing initiative. It was one of the best things I've ever been fortunate enough to do. And um, and I mean, I, I'm a returned Peace Corps volunteer, and the fact that this Syrian initiative was one of the most meaningful things to me then says a, says a lot. And one of the things, though, that started happening as a result, it's a good thing, but it was a very, it was a ghost, it was a stressful thing, 
is that then we started having all these other student groups coming to us. We had students coming to us saying, thank you so much for supporting these Syrian students. Um, would you be able to help support Palestinian students? We've got all these issues over here and like, would you be able to help with this? I had some Iranian students coming in saying, hey, we've got you know, the devaluation of our currency and we've got all this stuff, we really need help too. Um, you know, we had dreamers coming in saying they need to, they, so we had all these students that were so amazing and they cared so much and they wanted to help people from all over the place. And I totally agreed with them. Yes, we should solve that problem. That's a major problem. How do we do this? But I had my regular work. I had this initiative. I had all these things going on and this problem kept looming to the point where I would be walking through campus and I'm like, oh no, I see that student who really wanted to talk about, you know, the, the students from Iran and like, I, and I mean, there are times that I am very ashamed to admit it, but I have turned a corner or gone to be like, I can't face them. I'm so embarrassed that I told them I would try to do something. And I didn't. It's not for lack of wanting to or want, lack of care, but I just couldn't. I didn't have the time or I didn't have the resources, whatever. And I mean, there's so many other situations of projects, you know, that I was working on or whatever, where you know, I'd see people, I'm like, oh no, another email is coming in about this. Oh no, I'm seeing someone in this next meeting. Are they going to ask me about it? And it was again, that haunting feeling that would manifest just like how we were just reflecting. So it went from being like these problems that were just like these cute little ghosts like we've got here to being like this terrifying, overwhelming feeling like, how are we ever going to get past this? And so I want to think a little bit about, so why, why don't we address some of those problems that are looming over us? Some of it, you know, I like to think about the nature nurture thing. We think about our, us as an individual, who we are, as well as our environments. And so in thinking about ourselves as individuals, it might be because we lack confidence. It might be because we lack knowledge about how to do something. If we're thinking more about our environment, is it a lack of resources, like time, time? <laughs> None of us have a lot of time right now, right? Money, space. Is it a lack of support, whether it's from a team, um, your manager, or just a culture that isn't very supportive? So there's a lot of reasons why we might not be facing some of these problems that we have. And so I want you to think about some of those problems that you wrote down at the top of your worksheet, that some of the ones that you wanted to ground your conversation in today. And I want you to think about this question then below. So why haven't you solved these problems yet? And this is a no judgment zone, my friends. <laughs> It is no judgment, just honesty. So in very factual ways, I want you to write down a few facts about why you haven't. Not excuses, but facts, okay? No blame that you haven't addressed some of these looming problems. So take a moment to do that. So these examples that I gave before, I said a, a lack of confidence, a lack of knowledge, a lack of resources, a lack of whatever. And the lack, 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 it sounds like a bunch of quacking ducks, right? Lack, 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 lack. And that can be something that's really stressful because when you just think about everything being in the negatives, things you don't have. So let's flip that. How might we flip that? Think about what you do have. So rather than a lack, what do you have an abundance of? You have an abundance of care. You have an abundance of colleagues. They might also be stressed, but being stressed in, in unity is a little bit strengthening. You also have access to tools and knowledge that you have to this talk today. And one of the things that I want to talk to you about is something that is something that can help build you up is the, is the use of a particular framework, okay? And I mean, there's so many frameworks that you can use. I know that at UC San Diego, a lot of you, for example, use um, Lean Six Sigma, which comes with its own frameworks. Uh, I know that there are people that are um, ProSci certified, interested in change management that has frameworks. There are all these different frameworks that you can use. So use what works for you. But today I'm talking about the one that works best for me as someone who has learned about, you know, DMAIC and ProSci framework and all these other things. So this is... Um, I'm going to talk about some uh, framework that I use, a project leadership framework that, again, helps you go from 
problem to a tangible product that project that you can carry forward. But then again, going back to those reasons why we haven't been doing this and how a project leadership framework can help you address those. I'm gonna talk about three specific reasons that I often see come up with people. So one of those reasons is getting started is hard, right? I gave that example before that sometimes you're like, I'm gonna start this thing. And then you sit down to do it and you're working for like five seconds. And you're like, I, what do I even do? I don't, this is so overwhelming. I don't even know where to start. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Number two, sometimes we don't know what the right solution is. And that can be really frustrating, especially for those of us that are very future oriented. We like innovative approaches. We don't like doing the same old thing in the same old way. Because sometimes you can think, oh yeah, this is a problem. I know what the solution is. Someone might say that to you. Oh yeah, we just do that. You just implement this solution, no problem. But you might say, I don't think that's the right solution anymore. I wanna be focused on the future of higher education or the future of work. And sometimes those solutions just aren't gonna cut it anymore. So sometimes it's really hard when you're like, I know that whatever solution would be proposed wouldn't work, but the thing is, I don't know what the right solution is. So we'll talk a little bit more about that and how a project framework that I use can, can help you with that. Then the third one is the, I mean, the most heavy one, right? We don't have time. Cause you might be like, Megan, obviously the reason why I haven't solved these problems is because I don't have time. Okay, yes, <laughs> we, none of us have time. And I really want to acknowledge that and respect that. And um, I know how challenging it has been, especially during, um, during a pandemic, during um, a reignited social justice movement, during a lot of political turmoil and all these other things that, you know, if especially people in higher ed, people in the medical professions, people who are parents or have responsibilities of caring for um, elderly parents themselves. So we all feel like we don't have a lot of time here, but I'm gonna give you some tips today that might help you find some more time in your schedule without overburdening you. Okay, so let's talk about number one, getting started is hard. There's this really interesting um, axiom that I love from um, Ernest Hemingway. And uh, something that he would do is when he was wrapping up his writing for the day, he wouldn't just end with a clean paragraph or end of a page and the next day start with a blank page. What he would do is he would start writing a sentence and he would leave it half finished. And that might sound a bit wild, but the reason was is because the next day, he would come back and it was much easier to finish that sentence than it was to start fresh because getting started is hard. And momentum can help carry things forward, but what do you do if you don't have that momentum in the first place? How do you get things going, okay? Especially in a, when the problem is very nebulous. So one of my responses to that is when you're using a project framework that has predetermined phases, that tell you what to do in each phase and how to do it, it really helps ground the problem. And so the first step, the first phase in my project leadership framework is to clarify. And again, this is based on the creative problem solving process and the foresight framework. So when you clarify a problem in this first phase, in the first phase, there are pretty specific actions that you can take that are associated with the phase. So not only do you say, I'm going to start by clarifying, you are able to say, okay, within that phase, in order to clarify what the problem really is, and make sure it's not a symptom that we're solving, is, okay, I need to, I need to um, analyze some data, or uh, I need to understand the historical context of this problem. I need to do some benchmarking to see uh, what other groups are facing these problems. I need to do some best practices research. So there are specific things that you can do in each of those phases. So it goes from being something where you're like, I don't know how to get started to saying, you know what? I need to ask a few people about the history of this problem. And just that enough can be something enough to get you going so that you have that half written sentence at the beginning of the page so that you can keep going. So you're not staring at a blank page. In 
Um, so the second point that I wanted to address is we don't know the right solution. Okay, so like I said, sometimes we think we know a solution, an idea pops into our mind, but that doesn't mean it's the right one. So in going back to our, our process here, the second phase is ideation. And that's where you generate a lot of ideas about what the solution might be. And this ideation phase is made a lot stronger and better when you have clarified first. Instead of just jumping ahead, thinking you know a problem and without fully understanding it, moving ahead and jumping ahead to solutions. We're all guilty of that. And um, it's actually part of our natural way that we as humans are created. Our brains work in a certain way where we think, oh, I see a bear instinctively. How do I react? You know what I mean? Like, and you, you think you, you, you adjust right away and you try to react. You try to have a solution of what you should do to that threat that you see. But really, we need to start with first clarifying the problem, then moving on to ideation. And so how does this ideation phase help us get a great solution, the right solution? Um, well, first of all, we want to let go of the idea that there's even necessarily a right solution. We're just going to do our best to get a good solution and, and move ahead through our process. When you ideate, you really want to involve a diversity of voices. You want to intentionally leverage the inclusion um, that you have within your organization and pull in a lot of diverse perspectives and voices and, and generate as many ideas as possible. And there are a lot of formal ways that you can do that, but even just having a basic brainstorming session, um, if you use liberating structures, you can leverage some of those. But having an ID, you know, a period of ideation, you're going to create many ideas, generate many ideas, and then you narrow in on the best ones. The one that you want to carry forward into the next phase, which is develop, developing that solution, kind of making plans and, and um, making sure that you have the, the resources for things. So making sure that that would be a solution that might work. And then, you know, before you go on to implementation, where you're implementing the solution, and then optimization, where you're evaluating it and tweaking it and celebrating all the accomplishments that you've had as a team. So this is something that you can be a little bit more confident going into finding the, you know, a great solution or the right solution if you have an intentional phase for ideation. And it's not just like, oh, a senior leader told us we need to do this thing and we just have to go and implement it. Well, no, like maybe you can stop and say, we're gonna ideate around that. Then you're making sure that you're solving the right problem in a creative way and carrying that forward. The third point is we don't have time. So this is the one that I'm sure is the touchiest and something that I, <laughs> is we almost, you might have like a physical reaction to that. So when we don't have time, we feel sometimes a little bit um, out, of con out of control, we feel defeated. And by using um, a framework though, it can help. So I'll tell you how. There's a few different ways. I'm gonna unpack a few different ways. One is that when you have a project framework, so it's not just like, I'm gonna solve this problem, but you say, I'm gonna break this problem down into five distinct phases that have names and that have specific actions associated with them, it's easier to ground it and make it feel like you have a little bit more sense of control over it. Because time, you have no, really no control over it, but when you ground it like this, it makes it a lot easier. And um, Christopher Cox in his book, The Deadline Effect, um, he talks about this, but I mean, it's something that we've heard a lot of times, you know, a marathon isn't a 26 mile race, it's, um, 26 one mile races. You try to get, just finish one mile and then get to the next one. And so by breaking these things down into distinct isolated steps, it's very helpful in you some, we somehow make time for things when we know that they're due by a certain date. And you can feel a sense of accomplishment at each point and it helps remove that like haunting feeling a little bit when you feel that you have more of a sense of control over what you're working on. And by when you do have that focused timeline, we, you know, the work, work shrinks to fit the amount of time that we've allotted to it, right? So if, we, if I say I've got a week to work on something, or if I say I've got four hours to work on something, it's gonna be a 
a big, you're going to get the thing done in four hours. It might not be perfect. And that's okay. Um, because at least it's something that you can carry forward and that you have that momentum. Another element that I want to address with time is this really interesting research on context switching, you know, so when you're switching between different projects, it takes a lot of time away from you as you get resituated every time that you need to kind of switch the way that what your brain is thinking on it really takes time away from us. It's a very much a time thief and I know that, especially people in higher education. You're managing so many, not just only projects at once, but then you have, you know, you have to be working with um, students or faculty members, donors, community members, um, applicants. You've got all of these different people that you're working with. You have your colleagues, you know, sending you a chat or knocking on your door or whatever it is. And you've got all these things happening all the time. But I think this research is a very simple and really wonderful illustration. So let's look at this a little bit. On, um, on the x-axis here, it's the number of projects, right? So let's, this research is based on someone working on um, being responsible for five projects at any point. And the y-axis here is the percent of time per project that one can don't, uh, dedicate to that. So, you know, if you're just focused on one project, you theoretically have 100% of your time or your attention kind of focused on, on that one thing. But what happens when you suddenly split between two projects? You'd think, that, okay, 50% of my time will be on project A, 50% of my time will be on project B. But no, you end up losing, you end up losing time and focus in the context switching. And so you end up only spending 40% of time per project, okay? So you're losing 20% there. When you're working on three different projects at any point, it ends up being that you're only spending 20% of your time per project. And then it goes down to four and five. And so it's kind of like, oh my goodness, no wonder we're feeling all this pressure and these projects are starting to haunt us because we're just trying to do so many things at once. And this is a quotation from this, um, at Carnegie Mellon, their Software Engineering Institute, it, this article that said, once a team member is assigned five projects, his or her ability to contribute to any given project drops below 10%, with 80% of effort being lost to switching between project contexts. So that's massive. I mean, and this research is based on people that are software developers, you know, so people that usually have really isolated projects that they focus and they do coding and then they switch, you know. So I, it's, I know it's a different context, likely the type of work that you do. But I think no matter what, we, there are some big lessons that we can take from this that like, no wonder we feel like we don't have time <laughs> because by all the switching, we are, um, we're, the time is being stolen from us, really. So, okay, I can say that you can be like, well, Megan, no wonder I, I know, you know, but I know that I know that I don't have a lot of time. This isn't, you know, what can I do about it? So when we think about working on something, when you can get into flow, it is one of the best things that you can do for yourself. And the famous researcher who um, I think he unfortunately passed away last year, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, he, he's famous for this work on flow. He coined the term. And it's really interesting. I mean, it's, I've even read research that people who were more frequently got into a, um, a sense of flow, a state of flow, were more... Um, they handled the pandemic better. They were more resilient in handling the pandemic because when you're in a state of flow, that's like a natural state of bliss and contentment. When things outside of you are, are causing you a lot of stress, the, you can find um, a sense of flow and a sense of happiness and satisfaction um, just in what you're, you're working on yourself, okay? So when you're working on a project like this. Um, so again, solving a problem, but that's grounded in a project leadership framework, you can insert intentional opportunities for flow and collaboration in each phase. So for example, you can say, 
Um, okay, in the clarify phase, I have an analysis period. And if you use fancy terms like analysis period, I mean, it really makes it feel like it's something that you should put on your calendar, right? It's something that you shouldn't just, <laughs> not just a regular meeting. Don't ask people to meet with you. Ask for them to come do, you know, dedicate their morning to the analysis period with you. And you're sitting there and then you can go over analyzing the data. You can talk about the history of the situation and you can really dig into whatever it is. And when you're focused on something and you're saying, okay, everyone, we're putting our laptops away. We're putting our phones away. We're focusing on this one thing and we're gonna focus on it for a two and a half hour long period and collaboratively. And we have a very clear purpose of what we're gonna do then in that two and, a half an hour, two and a half hour period, let's say, you're able to accomplish a whole lot more than you probably could have over four hours of separate meetings spread out over the course of six weeks. And I know it can be hard to find those times. Everyone has different you know, um, calendars and things happening. So it can be hard, but, there's, but you can um, try, even just try as a first step of blocking some of these things off and intentionally building in opportunities for focus and collaboration and flow. During the ideate phase, you can have an ideation session. Um, it's best if, you know, it's, if it's facilitated, you have someone like Rachel or me or someone that can help you facilitate the session, a guided discussion to get out a lot of ideas, hear a lot of voices, make sure that there's an equitable discussion of um, ideas, but that's how you're gonna get, generate a lot of those ideas from which you can pick your favorite one. In the develop phase, you can have a planning workshop where you say, okay, everyone, we're going to get our Gantt charts going. We are going to, you know, plan out all of our steps for our project. We're going to make sure that we've got um, a budget for this. We're going to figure it out together and have a working block can be really helpful. You can have an implementation intensive, um, you know, something where you all get together and you're like, okay, we're really going to kick this off now. You can have, oh, my favorite, an evaluation party. Evaluation often gets thrown to the side, poor evaluation. Um, but during this optimized phase, you're not done solving your problem until you've optimized it, until you've evaluated it, seen how it's gone, make some tweaks, and until you've really celebrated your team and what you've done together to work on. So um, these are different ways that you can intentionally build in opportunities for flow with your colleagues. This same idea is illustrated. You might have seen in, in essentialism. Um, you might have seen that the same this visual is kind of drawn from there, inspired by there. That when you're really focusing on one thing, you can really, you know, just have a lot of drive and direction in one way. But when you're split between all these different areas and you feel pulled in all these different directions, you're not going to get very far. You get a lot farther by just focusing on one thing and then the next thing as much as you can. So. That's why I really encourage you to think about using a project leadership framework and thinking about how you might ground these really challenging problems into more um, uh, tangible action steps that you can take in collaboration with your team. And using a particular framework, you're gonna have consistent language with each other about what step are we on? What are we doing now? And you know what's coming next. There's that sense of confidence as you know what's coming next and it can really help you as you approach your challenges. So for those of you who have seen Ghostbusters, there's this really famous quotation that irks me quite a bit. So I'm gonna read it for you, okay? So Dr. Raymond stands, it's the um, it's a Dan Aykroyd's character. So personally, I liked the university. They gave us money and facilities. We didn't even have to produce anything. You've never been out of college. You don't know what it's like out there. I've worked in the private sector. They expect results. So while this is a, a, this is a dig at the traditional kind of um, privileged faculty member sort of approach, and um, I understand it's supposed to be funny, and I, I do have a sense of humor. I'm not that funny of a person, but I, you know, I have a good sense of humor, but this quotation in particular does kind of irk me because I have worked in higher ed in universities and I've expected results from myself and I've produced a lot of results. I've worked with a whole lot of amazing people that expect results and that produce results. And 
what I'm saying to you is, you know, this framework, I really believe in it. I was telling Rachel before we had this call that, you know, I, I honestly believe in this. I believe in that it works well. It's inclusive. It helps generate more innovative solutions. And it's something that can help people get results. So whatever framework you try to use, um, whether it's mine or, or someone else's, I encourage you just to think about some ways that you can proactively ground your actions and your problems so that you can carry things forward and so that you don't have these haunting problems hanging over you all the time, but that you instead end up with implemented and evaluated solutions. So um, we, again, we want to think about, you know, it's this quotation that's at the bottom here is one of my favorites, education without application is just entertainment. It's a great quote by Tim Sanders, because I mean, you're here today. I, um, if, if you don't apply, though, anything that you're learning, you may as you may have well have just been watching Netflix. Um, and Ted Lasso is a really great show if you're looking for a positive boost. Um, so if you're if you chose to be here today, instead of doing something like that over your lunch break now, um, I do want you to think about how you're going to apply this. So on your worksheet, what are your main takeaways? What's one small action that you can take in the next 24 hours to apply something that you've learned, okay? So just one small thing in 24 hours. Put it on your calendar, put it in your planner, whatever you do. Okay, and the third question here, what's one big step you'll take in the next two weeks to bust some ghosts? So in the next two weeks, something very tangible, a little, you know, a bigger step, but something that you can do so that you feel momentum. You don't start with the blank page. You know, you're starting here by saying something that you're going to do. So I invite you, you know, to, to write down responses to those questions. Then also I wanted to draw your attention to two opportunities that might be helpful for you. Um, I have a program called Refresh that where I basically teach that framework in a lot more depth. And so it's an online course plus a group coaching program. And I do it both with groups and, you know, the, sometimes I have a public one where people can just sign up and I run it together. But if you and your team want to get together and come together to, you know, a few teams come together to take this Refresh course together, you get um, to help each other and you apply a problem that you have and you literally work through that problem together as a team with my support on it. And so more information there um, is, you know, crestasolutions.com forward slash refresh waitlist if you're looking to join as an individual. Um, and then if you're looking to bring this to your team, you can learn more about it at crestasolutions.com forward slash refresh, um, or you can just contact me directly at this information down here. Um, more um, in the near future, you're also invited to a workshop that my colleague Caroline Auerkirk and I are running called Leading People When Everyone is Burned Out. It's a 90-minute workshop um, on the 21st of April, so in about three weeks um, from a, the same time, so, you know, 11 to 12.30 Pacific time. And um, it's a very fun and interactive workshop where we use Zoom and Mural and lots of conversation and interaction. And so if you want to register for that, you can go to tinyurl.com forward slash burnout um, dash higher ed. So that's my talk for you today. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions, everyone. Well, thank you so much for such an inspirational uh, and, and very practical presentation, Megan. I really think that there is a lot here that we can take and put into to action right away. You know, I, I, I remember that um, the statistics about tasks, the changing tasks, right? It's so tempting now to have multiple screens up and switch back and forth and change that so much. It hadn't, and, but you lose so much of your focus. You lose that opportunity for flow when you're switching that. So it's just a, another reinforcement of that. Um, I, I would like to, again, invite everyone to, if you would like to put your question in the chat, um, I'd be happy to, to take it that way and, and, and send it out to Megan. But Megan, I did want to, I had one right away um, at the beginning of the, of the session that I'd love to have you kind of expand on a little bit more. For those of us who have a hard time saying no, what are some of the advantages of addressing these haunting problems head on? How do we kind of build the courage for that? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we, when we want, when we wish that we could say to no to something that we feel like we have to say yes. So there's a lot of different things that go into it. Mm -hmm. Um, Psychological safety in the workplace is a kind of precursor to success in a, in a lot of different ways. And so if you feel like you can't say no to something because of a lack of psychological safety in the workplace, that's something that would probably need to be addressed head on. So that's like a whole okay. different um, issue. Mm -hmm. But then if it's also that you're just like, oh, well, that project looks really neat or mm -hmm. this thing looks really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes what I'll do is if someone comes to me and says, um, hey, Megan, do you think that you could work on, you know, this problem for me or, you know, on this mm -hmm. project, even just going back to that framework can be helpful because I say, oh, that's a really interesting idea. Why are you working? What's the problem that you're really trying to solve? Mm. And, you know, so one time there was a, a senior leader in higher ed that came to me and said, Megan, I want you to implement a, you know, a sample database where people at the university can put their, um, their contacts so that then we can contact them, these people for fundraising mm -hmm. purposes. And I was like, okay, well, first of all, I'm not an IT professional. So this is probably not, I'm probably not the best person to help you with creating a database, <laughs> especially mm -hmm. a sample database. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what's the actual problem that you're trying to, to solve? I said, let's go mm -hmm. back to clarify. Mm -hmm. And when he saw that we went through the, the, the problem was maybe a lack of trust that people don't want to just give all their contacts away, you know, mm -hmm. faculty members don't want to, um, and other people don't want to just like do that all the time and give away all of their contact information. They don't know what an organization is necessarily going to do with it. Mm -hmm. And we went back to that issue. And then when he saw that, I said, well, what might be other ways that we want to approach this first? We might need to first create a safe space to create under so that people understand how their um, how their data might be used. Why do you want them to share this information with you in the first place? You know, how might we start small? And so instead of telling him, no, I'm not going to do this project because I was in a difficult position to say no, mm -hmm. but instead going back and saying, okay, what is the actual problem we're trying to solve? Help me understand that. Mm -hmm. And that made it so much easier because when he was like, oh, okay, I don't even need you to do this project because that's not the right idea. Mm -hmm. And he went back. And so he needed to do more relationship building first. That's mm -hmm. what he, and there's no one could help him with that. He needed to take those steps and he needed to build those relationships. So Sometimes you need to just even start, instead of saying, no, you go back and you um, mm -hmm. really try to clarify before implementing a solution that's not the right solution. Um, one of, and on a more pra very practical level in terms of our daily work management is um, you could say to your manager, or your colleague, oh, that sounds like a really interesting project, especially if it's something that you actually would like to work on. Mm -hmm. um, and you say, all right, so I'm already at 100% capacity or 115% capacity is probably more like it, right? Mm -hmm. so this is already how many hours a week that I'm working this, you know, full time. Um, and so if I were to add that on, that would be an estimated five hours a week. So what do you think that I should do? What should I take away? so that we can help me prioritize. Mm -hmm. And that is a really eye-opening thing, both so that they understand that you are busy, you are, you're at capacity, but it also helps you and them together decide on priorities because they mm -hmm. might say, yes, I actually do want you to stop doing this other project mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. thought you maybe would have prioritized over something else. Mm -hmm. So knowing that maybe your manager thinks something else is of greater priority and you for specific reason really do need to approach that, that's helpful. But using very factual, um, you know, statements and using basic arithmetic, drawing something out and saying, yeah. this is the percentage, this is the amount of hours, approximately, it's mm -hmm. hard to estimate a lot of our work in hours, but um, that can be a, another helpful strategy. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. Just kind of going back to that first step to clarify, you mm -hmm. know, I, I think I, I'm one of those people, it's just like, yes, this is interesting. I'd love to help. And I, you know, the service mentality, I've seen it in a lot of organizations where, you know, if someone, if a student comes up to you and asks you for something, you want to be able to provide that, but also really understanding what it is that they are looking for can help you actually kind of get to that result and get you to the right result. So thank mm -hmm. you so much for that. We have another question in the chat. Um, this is from Marla. Everyone in my lab are incredibly overwhelmed. 
any strategies for approaching the discussion so they are even willing to discuss a new framework or paradigm. So they are pretty <laughs> resistant to everything now. This seems like a, you know, just I'm overwhelmed. I, I'm out of time. I'm, I just don't have the brain space to, mm -hmm. to take on another idea or project or paradigm or, you know, way of thinking. How, mm -hmm. how would you approach that? Yeah. So first of all, I'm so sorry that you're dealing with that. Um, I don't know if it makes you feel better to know that you're not alone in that at by any stretch of the imagination, although it might make you feel even worse, just the acknowledgement that so many people are feeling what you're feeling. Um, and I mean, that exact sentiment is exactly why um, my colleague Caroline and I created this series of leading people when everyone is burned out, because um, so many people are burned out right now. And Caroline and I both have um, backgrounds working in higher education, and both of us have master's degree focused on higher education. So we um, really feel and understand what you're going through, which is why we've designed um, this. I mean, we have like a full day workshop. We have a coaching program that can go with it, but we even have this 90 minute time when you're like, I need at least something that's a small burst of learning to help with that. And the framework that we that we teach in there is first kind of this awareness of the fact that we are burned out and how other people might be burned out. And then we go through thinking about what are shorter term mitigation strategies to help reduce some of those um, feelings of burnout and then also longer term strategies. And one of the things I would say, there's a, there's a difference. What we talk about um, in that workshop is a separation of how the, there's research by Emily and Amelia Nagoski that they write about in a book, Burnout. And they talk about these two different things of we burnout manifests itself in how we feel about it. And there's a separation between the stress and the stressors. That's maybe a clearer way to say it. The stress is how we're feeling and the stressors are the things that are causing us the stress. It's the project, it's the way your colleague spoke to you or whatever, but the stress is like the way you're feeling with it. And a lot of times in order to be able to address the stressors, we need to reduce the stress itself. And there are different ways that you can go about doing that. Um, the best one is through physical movement. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be an intense workout or anything, but it, even just um, uh, taking a moment to to physically even like clench your body up, clench every muscle in your body and then let it go that your body then gets a signal that it's safe for you to, um, to focus and you can even give any attention to the things that are causing you that stress. So I know it's not a, it's hard to address that question in just, um, a few minutes because we have a, you know, a whole set of solutions and a process that we take you through to help you identify some of that. But, um, I guess in the short term, I would always go back to what, what are the top two or three things that your, organ, that your group really needs to be focusing on? And is that a decision that the leader needs to make or that you make collaboratively as a group? Um, and how can you even just put anything that's not absolutely essential on pause? Um, and someone needs to give you that permission because any change initiative doesn't happen without that top person sponsoring it strongly, consistently, and authentically. So um, having that top person recognize that like, we're not gonna be able to retain good people if everyone is feeling burned out. And it's gonna be a lot harder to find new people than it is gonna be to retain them. Um, and focusing on, really respecting the people that are there and um, reducing those stressors so that you're really focusing on only the things that need to be focused on. Um, and maybe even approaching it in kind of a stealth way, going back to the clarify, like, so why are we doing all these other things? Why are we so stressed about, you know, this, this um, project when it's not even something that's part of our core mission of our department or our lab? Um, so those are a few thoughts. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, again, a, a little bit of clarification and, and 
a little bit of mindfulness, um, <laughs> I think can can really be helpful just to give people a, a mental break and building that in. You're yeah. right. You know, we're, we're seeing the great resignation, a lot of people not feeling uh, like they are appreciated for the work that they're doing. So um, I think I can see uh, reflections of these ideas kind of helping out with retention, with uh, having people feel really engaged with their work, even though there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done and a lot of projects that are that are still under high demand and high focus mm -hmm. so thank you so much for that um we are just at about time um for and uh, i didn't see any additional questions in the chat i did see some some thank yous for your response to that from marla for the the useful and insightful advice so i'm so happy that um that people did get some great information so i did want to as we start to wrap up our session uh at the uh at the end of our our presentation today Day, to let you know that if we do have any additional questions after our talk, please use our staff education email at UCSD so that you can communicate with us and, and let us know what resources that you are. Again, in the chat, I did drop in links to the, the burnout session. Um, I will absolutely be signing up for that. Uh, I think that is something that is just so timely and so important right now to be able to make sure, again, that we're, we're remaining connected and engaged with the work that we do. And maybe even sharing, Marla, with the refresh resources with your team so that they might be able to even in just a few moments be able to learn some tactics to be be able to, to connect and refresh and to, to uh, get engaged again with the work that they're doing. So it's not, it doesn't seem like just this endless list of tasks that they're working on. So thank you all so much. So I wanna thank you for joining the UC San Diego Learning Series. We are here for you to learn, to give you a small and mighty learning boost, to leverage, to inspire you to leverage inspiration into bite-sized resources. And we also want you to lead the way toward richer and more meaningful conversations. So I do want to make sure that you remember to, to keep connected with us and make sure that you, uh, you use the resources that are available uh, so that you can continue to join us for these sessions. So again, our Learning Boost series, I'm gonna play our video one more time as we round out our session and let us know if you have additional questions and feel free to use the chat to register for upcoming sessions in the future. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you everyone for attending. I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording now.